This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. John Bleasdale. I'm a writer and film critic. I'm not sure if I need to keep saying that, actually, but in any way. Today, I'm talking to Pamela Hutchinson, who is a columnist and blogger. Her work has appeared all over the place, including Sight and Sound and The Guardian. She is an expert on silent cinema and wrote the BFI Classics book on Pandora's Box. Wonderful film that everybody should try to see. A wonderful book that everyone should try to read. Remember, if you like the episode, please, 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 please like, subscribe, and in any way you can spread the word we depend upon uh, well i depend upon depend upon you guys the listeners to do my publicity work for me so please do that uh, you can follow me on twitter at dr jonty d-r-j-o-n-t-y but before you do any of that please enjoy this conversation I can't bear about um, you know when the things that put people off watching older films is this sort of thing when people say well you must watch it it's great and it's important and it normally means something that's four hours long and you just think oh you know it's a lot it's daunting to people why can't you show them actually a James Cagney film is going mm. to be 18 of your life and it's going to have so many ideas in it you're going to get excited about cinema and that's much to me that's much better than telling some of them that something is great or you know prestigious but that's just my opinion man how did you first get into silent cinema as such because it's not like it's not an obvious place to go for a lot of people no it's not and i think that's probably why i went there so when i was a teenager i lived nowhere near the cinema I lived in the middle of uh, nowhere. That's not true. I lived in a small town in the Midlands and there wasn't a cinema near us, but I was beginning to sort of, you know, watch more things on TV and begin to realise I was quite interested in cinema. So, you know, when I moved to London when I was 17, I started going to the local art house. I started going to the BFI. I started being able to watch a lot more of the things that people said you should be watching. And I don't even mean like a really serious canon so much as the things that were recommended in magazines. And I was enjoying lots of these films, but they were so clearly not designed for 17 year old girls you know and I was just like I realized I was gonna have to find something in the cinema that stimulated me and excited me like these good films did but that was just off the beaten track I was never going to be that person who was all over what was really popular then was the late 1970s great films absolutely great films but a lot of them are not you know not what you want to watch at that age so I started just picking a few things at random and it ended up being silent films that just I would go and see a program of shorts at the BFI completely out of context knew nothing about what studios who the star was whether these were prestigious things or whether these were well connected in film history and just found it interesting and I loved I love the power of silent cinema, obviously, the way that you use your imagination, you feel so engrossed. But I also loved being a bit untethered from all the things that I'd heard about cinema, the, the sort of sense of mystery about the history. You know, I can imagine what it was like to go and see certain recent Hollywood films for the first time, something made in the last sort of 50, 60 years. But I, you know, at that point, and we still have lots of gaps, I didn't know too much about how people were watching these films, you know, and how they were enjoying them, what they felt about them. And I just thought, you know, this has got everything I love about cinema, but it's got questions that I want to answer. And I certainly wasn't thinking about it in any kind of uh, studious context. I just, I just thought it was very cool, which uh, probably proves that I wasn't cool. <laughs> but I mean, it's paradoxically, you're looking at a sort of freshness, really. Yeah, I mean, the thing I always say about cinema, um, silent cinema, is that I don't love it because it's old. I love it because it's so new. You know, everyone's trying new things all the time. Sometimes they really don't work, and sometimes it's really exciting. You see people realising that they can move the camera in this way, or that they can, you know, change the focus and the stage scenes in different ways. But sometimes it's the odd little clunky bits that I love too. But yeah, um, you see people, like, inventing an art form in front of you and what is not to love. One of the things I always like talking about the clunky bits is whenever I'm watching a silent movie and it's there's a bit where they're indoors 
and you can see the sort of there's an obvious wind <laughs> that, that, that shouldn't be indoors blowing the things the the I don't know the napkins on the table or something and it's I just love that that oh you know you know they're filming probably without a roof so they can use it all the available light it's just such a funny sort of like yeah you want, I, I can imagine the camera pulling back away from the camera and you just there's a wall and, and a beach or something behind them yeah I mean and you hit on like a really important point because one of the things that's happening in the early days of film is people are, are stopping treating it like theatre when you totally accept a certain amount of artifice and painted backdrop and the fact that they're all going to sit in one line on one stage and they're not going to move and realising that they have to have more realism and they can have more dynamism you know that they can move around in different ways so you see everyone working this out in different ways and one of the things that people often ask um, about the outdoor shooting is obviously because there isn't much light so quite often uh, films have these um, it's not a very complex code but a code of tinting coloured scenes so you take that same shot and you, you wash it blue to make people know it's at night, or you wash it in kind of amber glow to show it's, it's daylight, you know, by contrast. And people say, is that original or is that something added? And it's like, yeah, no, they tried that. Like, they did. I mean, it sounds sort of quite simplistic and naive. But yeah, people thought, great, let's just dip the film in some blue dye. And it works. You know, it tells you everything you need to know. It's not as sophisticated as when you have better polychromatic film stocks and better, more sophisticated studio lighting. Yeah, that is officially better. But the sort of sense that people are like making up how a film is going to look. Because a film could have been anything, you know. You know, it was an invention without a future. You know, it could have just been actualities. It could have just been realism all the way, you know. And then, you know, Alice Lee Blaché was like, maybe we could have a story about a fairy. Uh, and suddenly, <laughs> like, well, no, maybe cinema can be adventurous, exciting costumes, sets, you know, everything that we now think of it as being. And it's still also the same device that you know, you have a little screen on your dashboard of your car to show you what the back of your car looks like so you can park, like, the most mundane use of the moving image in the history of the world. It's all the same. You know, it's that, and it's in the heights. I get the train, and there's occasionally you, there's a, they've got little TV screens showing you what's happening at the entrance of the, you know, where people get on and get off of the train. And so if the train's crowded and people are standing there, you're just watching, you know, people checking their phones, picking their noses, and it, it's kind of... It's a perfect sort of people-watching device. People-watching device. I mean, that's exactly what it is. And I remember, so after sort of being this sort of hapless teenager stumbling around the BFI thinking I might go watch some Max Linder films, I, you know, went to university and became a bit more of a film nerd. And then I did a postgraduate degree in film history or the history of film and visual media, which sounds very Oh, the, the syntax makes it sound much more, you know, swapping around the... Yeah, getting rid of the Anglo-Saxon genitive. I love it. I could I could tell people that I've got a master's in art history. I would be lying. But one of the most, of obviously, great course, great lecturers, brilliant stuff. We sort of focused on technological innovations. And we talked a lot about early film. And one of the, the things that was said that was most sort of powerful to me is Laura Mulvey, who obviously is a genius, talking about the film, which you've probably seen, I don't know if you know it, A Train Leaving Jerusalem Station. Yeah. Right. She said, this is one of my favourite films. I just love it. And I think that's what gave me permission in a way. My brain just clicked, oh, you are just allowed to be enjoying these things because the train leaving Jerusalem station is just what you're saying about your train. You're watching people and they're all lined up. You know, they've all got some connection to the train that's leaving. You know, they're lined up according, literally according to class because mm -hmm. it's a train platform. And you just, you see children's faces and you see people who are in a state of emotional excitement and you're just watching people. And yeah, that is a beautiful film. There are people who will just say it's a demonstration of a certain technical invention. But uh, yeah, I'm with I'm with Mulvey on this, as on many other things. <laughs> it's just a really enjoyable film. And I, I mean, I, I do quite like a little bit of um, Victorian and early 20th century cinema, though you don't often get asked to talk about it. Maybe I should stop talking about it now. <laughs> I'm interested in the idea of cinema being like a time machine because, I mean, when I grew up, when I grew up, a lot of the people were still alive. You know, Cary Grant was still alive. Mm. Elvis was still alive. A lot of those old movie, Robert Mitchum, all, all those movie stars were still among us. Now they're, they're almost all gone, the, those names, and the and the silent stars even more so. And then going further back, well, obviously. So there's, there is a weird sort of time travel aspect to it, which I find utterly compelling. 
we're all going to uh, run the risk of seeing our great grandfathers and great grandmothers, great 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 in these films. So and you wouldn't know almost that's the thing, but you can you can see these footage of like places where you live. And I know the town that I'm from in the northwest of England. Like I've looked it up, you know, on the BFI player, and I've found you know what's happening at their Easter parades in uh, you know <laughs> years gone by, and, and it's, it's wonderful because you think well, you know these are people who walk down the same streets as me, even if they're not related to me. I mean, obviously, you have things like the Battle of the Somme, where you, you know, we've all got most, many of us have got ancestors who were there, and it's such a momentous occasion. But yeah, I think it would be naive to think that only these films are time capsules. Everything is, you know, everything is. When you look at this, is such a banal way of putting it, but you know, if you look at the actress's eyebrows in any costume drama, you know exactly what period it was made in. And if you look at the way that they write the storyline and how men and women behave to each other, then you also know. And um, so, you know, every film is a time capsule. It's just like some of these ones that are very pure about it mm. very pure about showing you yeah um what was what was the first film that you you know going back to that 17 year old girl what was that first film that you thought right this is you know where you really got that spark of this is oh this is really for me i like this do you know what? i don't remember something from when i was that age i remember something from when i was much younger watching on like half term afternoon films with my mum and i remember watching david lean's great expectations Right. And I suppose I had that, the idea we were talking about earlier about films just filming the dialogue from books in front of stage sets in my head because I was only a kid. And then I watched the opening sequence of that, you know, the camera roams around them, was it beautiful? And it just clicked in my head. Oh, the camera's telling the story. And then just from then point on, I think I just, whenever I watched a film, I was like, what is being shown to me that isn't just the fact that someone's come in to the room and said, you know, your father's dying, you must get the coach to <laughs> whatever, you know. <laughs> and that's that sort the of thing that really intrigued me. You know, what, what, what else am I being told? I suppose it's just like enjoying the language in a book. I was quite a bookish child. So yeah, it's the, the grammar of the of the camera movements and and being a part of a story of that. Mm. I, I uh, you put a link uh, on the email when we were sort of uh, going back and forth about the time for a film called Suspense by it's Lois Weber is the name of the director. You have to excuse my ignorance. My silent knowledge is very is limited. I would I would say I think it would be fair. I've probably seen more than most people, but but certainly not enough to in any way consider myself. So I, I'm looking forward to being educated. Anyway, seeing suspense. <laughs> Wow, what's the what about that film? I mean, there's camera angles there. There's the use of the sort of the rear view mirror of a car. There's the cut of the the triangle sort of CND sign where you have um, <laughs> all the three images. Split yeah, split screen. That's the word I'm looking for. That's, that's amazing. What an amazing movie. It reminded me a bit of, of Fritz Lang in there as well, a bit of spion in. Yeah. yeah. So Suspense is a home invasion thriller, a film, you know, it's the, it's the format that are being made. I sent you that because you told me you were quite familiar with D.W. Griffith's features, like the big features. Yeah. And, you know, it's so funny. It's like, it's not interesting or radical or cool anymore to say, oh, do you know what? T.W. Griffith isn't everything. Because I don't think anyone is being taught that anymore. And if they are, right. they probably need to change their school. But, you know, yeah, there is more to cinema than that. And Suspense by Lois Weber is a sort of 10-minute film from 1913, which sort of does all these things that we've been taught about, about Griffiths and the development of cinema, and it all being about cross-cutting. But there's cross-cutting in there. But there's also like eight of the different tricks she does with the frame. She shows you the invader coming to the house from such a high angle, which in itself just looks so wicked cool. Like it looks brilliant. You're like, wow. Of course, what she's showing you there is the perspective of the woman in the house. She's not showing you a suffering damsel in distress. She's showing you what it feels like to be the woman in the house. And of course, she's playing the woman too. So we have this film that it just so exciting and so thrilling and such a wow moment and also it's just slipping the female gaze into there as well and you know i just like to show people that because in you know 10 minutes you suddenly got excited about transitional cinema <laughs> and the fact that i'm calling it transitional cinema makes it sound really genius but you know this is how we get to the features you know you don't get to literally try to think of a film that came out recently <laughs> you don't get to dunkirk without having you know the development of the thriller and all these devices I'm trying to think of a big big film but of course they all um they're, they're all on hold you don't get no time to die yeah yeah <laughs> Godzilla versus Kong Godzilla versus Kong which I fell asleep in front of and now I'm really well you know sleep is good for you I think you're I think you're absolutely right and that's another good uh, who do, uh, I think was it Jeff Dyer or someone there was somebody who wrote about sort of falling asleep in a film as kind of part of the appreciation of a movie that there are some films that actually helps not just in a sort of snidey you know oh that was boring but in a sort of like actually coming in and out of the uh you know of uh, 
I don't know, a, a David Lynch film, sleep could be could be quite complementary to the experience. Or nightmarish. Yeah, that could be awful. I definitely I took my partner to see a screening of Decasia, the Bill Morrison film that's made up of lots of snatches of film suffering badly from nitrate decomp. I don't I can't believe he's still married to me, quite frankly. Uh, he <laughs> fell asleep in that had wicked dreams. He would not agree. But I do agree that sometimes it can be quite good to be a tiny bit bored in a film. Good for you as a critic, I mean, because you have to look at something else. When I talk about a film like The Train Leaving Jerusalem Station or this kind of thing, you know, it's it's, it's really good, like, critical practice to look at a film. And of course, your first thought would just say, what happens in the film? Well, the train just leaves the station. But of course, if you force yourself to try and describe what's going on, you find you find all the riches. And you know, I'm sure every, every film would benefit from this, you know. But, you know, what exactly is going on at any one moment? I mean, I think that it's the way to learn how to be a proper critic, because the thing I can't bear, <laughs> I think I might have said this twice, once already about something else that I can't bear. The thing that is mildly annoying to me mm. is when people say, oh, well, I didn't like that film. It's basically this. It's like basically nothing. Like we're all basic if you basic us. Like tell me what's <laughs> extra in there. Tell me what's on top of the basic. Yeah, the boy met the girl, I know, but come on. <laughs> what kind of shoes was he wearing? <laughs> shoes. <laughs> you know, everything, everything is interesting, you know? And well, the silent film nerd would maybe say that but yeah everything is interesting and everything's there for a reason um and if it wasn't put in there for a reason it's still part of the film so we always have this with early film the dog there's always a dog that right. just strays into the camera right. <laughs> one of the ways where you can describe like the development of film narrative you can talk about editing you can talk about shot construction and scenes and all this kind of thing you can also talk about the point when the dog was in there for a reason <laughs> Like, rescued by Rover. I mean, that's also, like, how... I, I think it's getting away from the idea of film as, as purely or, or, or primarily a narrative form. You know, it's it's like... There are so many films that I really, really love that it's like the story is the least interesting part of the movie. It's it's That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for the mood. Yeah. I'm here for the, you know, whatever. But Ozu said, plot bores me. I'm with Ozu. Like, it's right. I mean, you know... There are some films where the plot is quite exciting, it's true to say. But very often, it's everything else that happens in that. I mean, every love story ever. It's it's about what's happening between two people on screen and the obstacles in their path. It's not about the idea that two people want to get together and procreate rather badly. Like, you, know, <laughs> you, you shouldn't reduce anything to the bare bones of narrative. Some films don't even have to have a narrative. One of the last films I went to see before lockdown was Colour Correction. I haven't seen that. People were walking out in horror. It was a festival in Paris. It's the film, I can't remember the name of the director, where it's just the colour correction reel from a 90-minute movie. So you, there's no plot, there's no narrative, there's no audio, there's no scenes, there's no faces. It's just the colour changing ever so slightly for 90 minutes. And you have to find a way uh-huh. to engage with it or just walk out. <laughs> well, I mean, walking out is a way of engaging in it. I mean, it's, it's mm. like... Uh, was it Hanukkah who said, you know, um, people who walk out of my films don't need them? The people who stay are the people who are like me are pretty sick. And uh, well, I'm adding this last bit, but I guess that's what he meant. It's just true. And I have to say that was a really interesting screening. And I wish my French was a little better. There were definitely people who were checking their phone and there were people who were sleeping. Now, those people, I mean, they should have gone to a cafe, really, um, in Paris, for God's sake. But someone got up and stood at the top of the stairs just by the door and screamed at us all saying we were, we were fools to stay. I'm pretty sure he said you know he said whatever the french equivalent is of you know the emperor has no clothes and i if you don't even ask yourself that question when you're watching a film you know is there a point in watching this i suppose you're not engaging and um, obviously that was very rude and i think the filmmaker was in attendance so i'm not encouraging that but that was my experience of watching the film of deciding in that moment well even though he's called me an imbecile i'm gonna stay <laughs> fact, that's probably my experience of watching a lot of films, even if someone's going to call me an imbecile, I'm going to stay. Yeah, I, I find it difficult to walk out of movies. I really do. I, although, you know, at festivals, sometimes it's just necessary to save your sanity. I, I once walked out of something at Pordenone and I, I felt so bad about walking out of it. I had to get myself really worked up and quite angry about the reason why I was going to walk out. So I sort of stood up and went under my breath, oh, I just can't take it anymore, and left. And I completely understand why I could have got something from staying. But at that point, I just didn't need to see another racist early Western. Right. Um, I'd seen a few, and I think I'd got the gist of the Mexicans being the bad guys at that point. And I know, 
I know I was told I missed out on great things, but that was just my moment then. It's not something I make a habit of doing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I like the in at Venice in particular, the film festival there. There's a tendency to sort of shout something at the end of the screening, and sometimes it can be, you know, there was one time it was quite is pretty disgusting because I think it was the Nightingale that someone shouted out something quite offensive. But usually it's sort of, you know, it, it's obviously, it's always a sentence. You know, it's always, this guy is a complete fraud or, or something like that. It's never, so you can tell the person who's shouting it out, it's not really spontaneous. They've had a, they've had a think during the film. I'm going to shout out at this one. What am I going to say? And so, but, and there's a bit of me, I have this sort of attraction repulsion to that kind of behavior. There's the English part of me that goes, no, you should, really shouldn't do that. It's really rude. And then there's the Irish part of me that goes, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> you, know? you know that there are people in any festival screening or probably lots of screenings that you go to um, who are thinking, what's the pity thing I'm going to put on Letterboxd or what am I going to tweet about this film? Maybe he's just being more honest if he screams it out loud. Yeah, it's not it's not polite behaviour and I do like being polite. It's a terrible problem being a critic when you sort of think that it's really politest to keep one's opinions to oneself. <laughs> But it depends what type of critic, because critic doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be negative and lambast people. It's It can be someone who's trying to celebrate stuff and be constructive. I'm I'm lucky in that I'm not a like, weaker release critic, so I get to review lots of new films, I get to talk about lots of old films that obviously have their problems, but I don't feel compelled to watch every little thing and offer an opinion on it, and therefore I can often be quite constructive. I mean, sometimes I'm so sick of people saying things are good or bad. I would I would kill for a proper description of what was in the film, and I don't mean the plot, obviously. <laughs> yeah, again, do you like it or not is often the, the least interesting question. It's sort of like, well, why didn't you like it? Not, not you know, if you liked it or disliked it. I never ask myself, am I enjoying this? Do I like this? Because believe me, if the film's really bad, that opinion will come to you like, you know, so halfway through the film, yeah. you say, God, no. But what's wonderful sometimes is when you're halfway through watching a film and you just get that feeling of joy. You're just like, this is just beautifully made. I felt like that when I watched Nomadland at home and I felt like that double when I watched it at the cinema again recently, just to pick like a really recent example. Mm. Um, it very often happens to me with a silent film. But yeah, I just, I just thought, you know, I mean, you could discuss many aspects of this film, but I am enjoying this beautiful filmmaking and I'm admiring it and I'm engaging with it and I'm learning something about the world and just, that feeling is probably why you keep going back to the cinema. There's a moment when you can get quite tired of cinema at times when you can feel I've seen, as you say, I've seen enough racist films or I've seen enough whatever you know, the, the, the trope of the time is. And then you see that film that, that just kicks, you know, absolutely kicks you up the arse and, uh, in, a, in a great way. Um, what, you went into film sort of academically as well then with your, with your... I did a master's degree but I was working in a DVD magazine at the time and after that I went and worked as a newspaper journalist. So I've never been an academic, but because I work on such old films, I sort of end up being sort of dragged into a sort of semi-academic space sometimes, which is really embarrassing because right. I'm not, because I don't have a PhD and because I can't write that way. Even when I was doing my degrees, that would always come back, you're not writing in an academic way. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I do end up doing things that are a little bit more research-based or working with people at universities and doing a bit of teaching. But I'm I'm just a hack, John. Oh, cool, cool. Oh, good. <laughs> game recognises game. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I w when I went to university, I went to Liverpool. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Where are you from in the northwest, by the way? Uh, I'm from Birkenhead. Ah, oh, right. Okay, right across the water then. Brilliant. So I, when I went to university, I, went, I was doing my degree there uh, in literature and there was a guy called Jeff Ward. He was there and he was doing this sort of film course, like a, a, an elective. And it had everything that I wanted. It was Cronenberg. It was, you know, and this was early 90s. And it was amazing. looked amazing. And I didn't take it because I just thought, I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, but I'm never going to read Chaucer. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to read Chaucer. Uh, you know, I need to be forced to read Chaucer. Whereas I've always had this slight quantum leap moment where my life sort of went into, you know, I imagined what if I'd gone on that knife edge and I'd gone into sort of academic more. And when I started writing, I started writing for academic sort of film journals doing book reviews. That was my first, um, mm. yeah, just because for some reason... 
the majesty of the written word was this, you know, it's been something I haven't been able to shake off. And still, you know, even doing this podcast about books on film. So <laughs> it continues to this yeah. day. All right. So your relationship isn't is, isn't as academic as, as your online presence would suggest, madam. Well, I think having an online presence is very academic. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not, in that case, anybody who doesn't know me is listening to this. I do not have any false credentials listed on my website or on my Twitter <laughs> bio. I think people just assume because it's old, you must, you know, you must be writing this like pontificating, um, well, or just very much more rigorous. I'm writing criticism. I'm doing history. Like right. the first time Radio 4 called me a film historian, I sort of went, ooh. But actually, yeah, I'm doing some history and writing the Pandora's Box book was that. But I am, um, so I must be a wee bit younger than you. When I went to apply to university, I considered doing film studies right, or even like an English and film studies mix. And I was very, very, very heavily advised not to do that because I was good enough to do English and this would be a lesser degree. And I hope that that's not the case, you know, with people anymore. I mean, I'm delighted. I read Chaucer. I quite liked it. Um, <laughs> Like reading Chaucer and Old English, you know. But you know, and I think that my literary studies, like it does influence you. I'm really interested in adaptation and working on an adaptation project now. But also one of the things my course did was it made you go right back to the beginning. So we did, you know, I had to translate Old English. And I suppose I sort of carry on that rigour. I'm like, well, let's let's talk about Jaws later. First, we have to talk about Georges Méliès. You know, I still have that kind of attitude in my head of like you should have gone back and done the reading from the earlier part of the course like the full syllabus <laughs> but yeah I'm, I'm sorry if I've been masquerading myself as an intellectual no no not at all no uh, no it was actually that phrase film historian that just led to my sort of my assumption uh, but I thought that's a that sounds like a brilliant name for a book from from Jaws to George Milliers do you know what that would be amazing actually yeah or maybe just on what, what would we call them sort of analog prop making just like the best you know because he always had all these wonderful like things that he'd created in his studio so you know and I'm, we're all over pixels aren't we so yeah. go back to sort of real world props and right from from George to Jaws let's let's talk a bit about the Pandora's box film because it's a film that I had and, and your BFI book and I'm so jealous of that of you doing that book not well not jealous what's the word I'm in awe of you because when I was doing my uh, I, I carried on in academia for far too long and when I was still there well, your doctor yeah I am Dr Johnny <laughs> which which it only is the only effect it has on my life is my mum addresses all my Christmas cards Dr John Leesdale and and my Twitter handle that's the, that's the only impact it's had on my entire four years well spent I think we can all agree you know a, a wise woman was like do your do your degree she said this she's talking about bachelor's degree she said sure you know it might not help your life but when you pull the push handle you'll ha you'll remind yourself I'm clever I've got a degree so, <laughs> so a phd you must you can breeze past any social gaff with that just, i just i just walk into glass doors constantly <laughs> and this is where we get to slap it exactly oh, nice nice segue no wait a second let's do pandora's box first but i do want to i do want to talk about comedy and, uh, and and slapstick as well but the reason i uh, i was in awe of you in terms of the the authorship of a bfi classics book because those were my i had a study room in the library and I was doing Shelley and laughter and the theory of laughter and Henri Bergson and all this stuff. And it was great. I enjoyed it. But my break was to go to the cinema section and they had a big collection of BFI classics and just nab one at random and read it. And, uh, you know, and it would take me an hour to read or whatever. And it just felt like, oh, now I can go back to work. And oh, it's just brilliant. So I really loved your book and I really loved that uh, sort of application. But uh, Pandora's Box, why uh, was that something that you were sort of assigned or did you pitch it? Is that and what? And if so, why? OK, I'm deciding here how honest to be. How many people listen to this? Like millions, right? Oh, okay. literally nobody. Um, <laughs> so, um. I'm often drawn to things that are a bit too difficult for me is right. a problem that I have. But yeah, so I was introduced to a person who was who had commissioning power and someone said, this is Pamela and she should probably do one of your books, which obviously isn't the job done. And she said, well, what would you do then? And I think she sort of said something like, oh, it would be great to get more silent films or something. And, and I just knew, because like you, I was a fan of the fan of the series. I knew what was missing, as it were. Mm. So I said, oh, someone's got to do Pandora's box. Now, just in case anybody is thinking, terrible things I, I did have to 
go away and do a full book proposal and that kind of thing. In fact, my old tutor said to me she would forgive me for not doing my PhD if I did the, the book. So it, it's what I did instead and it's not right. as rigorous as a PhD. But I thought that this was a film that was really interesting and it's a really complex and confusing film. I think the first time I watched it, I was very confused by a lot of things. Also, not too much is out there about its production, partly because it was a flop, that's just as easy as it gets, and partly because I felt that there, while there is some great writing on this film, there are some things that just repeat the same things again. And a lot of people are quite taken with the feelings that they have when they watch Louise Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> and this wasn't really a problem for me. <laughs> I think she's marvellous, but there we go. <laughs> so I just thought it'd be interesting. This is a female-led film. Louise Brooks was one of the most fascinating people in film history, like absolute legend and mm. wrote great film history. Always, always wonderful. I thought, let's just give this film a fair shake down and shake through and see what falls out of it, really. But then I had to write the damn thing. Ah, the tough part. How long did it take you? Was it a... Uh... A long run. Oh, you don't want to know this. It took me about five weeks. So basically, I quit my job for other reasons, you know, and so I wrote this book in five weeks. Obviously, all the research had been done while I was working full time separately, but the writing of it didn't. I suppose that's not long, but it seems now I look at it and think five weeks work. It's only thin. And lots of pictures. <laughs> Lots of pictures, nice big font. I didn't have to do an index. It was an absolute doddle. You know, I did do the slightly cheating thing of, of the, there's some material towards the beginning that takes the film different angles, but then I did go act by act. But that's because the acts are quite separate in this film. Right. I thought it was actually quite useful to go act by act. But of course, that means you just basically get to write eight different essays on the film rather than something that sort of accumulates and accumulates. But yeah, I mean, absolute joy to work on. The film is so fascinating. I managed to dig in and find some things that people hadn't found or hadn't written down if they had. So yeah, I mean, I I thoroughly recommend digging your nose into the most complicated film you can think of. One of the things I loved about that film was the, I'm not sure if loved is the right word, but it's the, the thing that Jack the Ripper turns up. And it, it just feels like such a strange sort of... I mean, it's got that moralistic thing going on and it's got a lot of, you know, the, 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 the life, you know, the life of the uncontrollable, uncontrolled, free, independent, etc. And then you have this, this really creepy ending that, uh, that just kind of darkens everything. I really enjoyed that. I mean, enjoy, again, I keep saying liked and enjoyed and that's, that, those aren't the right words exactly. I appreciated it, let's say that. There are people who still have a real problem with that. I mean, it's hard. It doesn't make sense. We want to see her do well. And if something bad is going to happen to her, you think it's going to follow on naturally. But of course, once you've seen the film, and this is terrible spoilers, you realise the whole point of the film is that she's always going to get murdered by a sex maniac, that that's her fate. And that's horrific. If you think if you think the, pl the film is a bit grim, you should read the play. All right. so it's very gruesome and much more explicit about the idea that this is, you know, what's happening. I mean, Louise Brooks is like you. She's sick. Sorry, I mean, um, like Hanukkah. And she embraced <laughs> the ending fully. <laughs> I don't mean that about you. Just it was off your comment. Like, yeah. uh, she embraced the ending fully. She said it should have been more gory. Uh, you know, knife in the vagina, all that kind of thing. She really, really thought that, you know, it was wonderful and it was... And it's interesting, you know, it's meant to be this moment, this thing that she thought would happen to her, Lulu, thought would happen to her. And the way Brooke says it is something like, oh, the moment she's always dreamed of, which is a very, has a very different interpretation to it. It is a sort of slightly baffling film. People come and go without any sort of explanation. And Jack the Ripper is just, I mean, one of the most, <laughs> the biggest surprises in film history. I think the fact that he just turns up uh, conveniently there to sort of take her away, take this sort of, free radical out of society. I definitely did not like the ending the first time I saw it. That that ending feels like it's replicated in, in very recent films as well. I mean, I haven't seen it, but I have read a detailed plot synopsis because because I'm uh, I'm weird. But Promising Young Woman, I think, has uh, feels to me, at least from what I've read, has a, a similar kind of like, kind of, oh, this is terrible, but what were you expecting sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I have watched Promising Young Woman, okay. and I wouldn't spoil it for you, except you've read of it. The, the moment when she is being murdered, you go through so many emotions because you think, oh, no, he's really strangling her quite heavily. But you just are convinced that she's got to survive because she is the protagonist, because she's got this mission, because she has this slightly righteous mission. It's also a terrible sort of negative obsession for her, of course. But, yeah, you can't believe that she's actually going to die. And then she dies. And then 
the suggestion is that she was quite sure she would and she was quite accepting of that fact. Oh, I mean, there are many ways in which this is quite worrying as mm. films go, because we see so many films where women get murdered that a lot of people are a bit like, did you need to make another one? I can understand that. That's one of the reasons why <laughs> I got a bit upset when I first watched Pandora's Box, much like when I was quite young and I watched Vertigo. I was livid, absolutely livid. I'd gone all the way through this film for that. <laughs> and of course, there's more to the film than the plot. <laughs> And more to the plot than the ending, although the ending always seems to have this huge, yeah, it can sort of work, it can it can save or it can destroy a film, and I don't think that's just sort of recency bias. I think there's a capstone. I, if you were sort of like, if if somebody hasn't watched Pandora's Box and you were to what? No, because I was like, I wouldn't say Jack the Ripper is what I wouldn't say. See, I would. I'd say that, that ending is. That's the thing. I kind of, in a, in a way, a sort of. A weird ending like that is kind of just so interesting. I could totally understand why it, why it doesn't work necessarily. You know, the does ex machina uh, just sort of wanders in. Slay, but, slasher ex machina. Is that slasher, right? Slasher ex machina. But if you were to if you were to sort of like say to someone who hasn't watched ma- many silent movies, you know, what in particular about Pandora's Box make it make it the one that you suggested for the BFI book series, classic series? What was what is your what what is your motivation for that for that choice? I mean, my motivation is almost entirely Louise Brooks, um, right. and wanting it, we have with Pandora's Box, we have this fascinating and very rare situation where the leading account of the making of the film is given to us by the leading lady. This is so rare; it's like almost people forget who directed it. I mean, now the, there's so immediately you have two questions: you have, well, let's find out what the director thought he was making, and let's go into that a bit more. But also, you you have to sort of interrogate this amazing account we have of making the film, which is an account from a young woman, very young, who didn't speak the language of anyone else on set, who was drinking quite heavily and was away from home for the first time. So it's it's not necessarily the most reliable account ever. So to me, there were just lots of big questions about it. I think that the film is weird and complicated and is best understood if you've read the Vedakin play that it's based on, which is completely palindromic. So that sort of makes sense of the ending in some ways but that's not how people encounter it and there's still something just precious about the fact that people go to the cinema because the beautiful woman the beautiful fascinating woman in the film and you can watch that whole film and almost not notice the plot because she is so captivating and she isn't like anyone else that you see in the films you can't call her a flapper you can't call her a vamp she's completely different even though we can then go into like Lola Lola in the Blue Angel and sort of various characters that are similar you don't get many Lulus when I was writing the book or working on it or quitting my job to write the book <laughs> you know I had to tell friends who didn't have any interest in silent cinema what I was doing and they said what's the film like and you said oh god <laughs> you know this is a really hard question and I say it's like an erotic thriller it's an right. erotic thriller but from the 1920s because it has that something about it you know that it's going to be deadly and dangerous and really licentious and hedonistic in many ways and who doesn't want to watch a 1929 erotic thriller you've sold it yeah so you- <laughs> So we've got Jaws to Georges uh, Millet. We've got Pandora's Box to Basic Instinct. We, we... I would start before with the vamp films. I'd start with Aston Nielsen in Denmark in 1911. But oh. yeah, you, you definitely the, the roots of the erotic thriller are deep, deep deep you know these really dangerous and sexy and dark violent films that were made in the silent era they loved a bit of that you know and then we sort of got a bit more after the code came in we got a bit more prudish you see that's that's the difference between you and me because i would have gone back to the wife of bath you know i would have i would have, yeah i would have gone right the way back you know again yeah. another another tale of you know rape and and yeah, violence and sex being linked. And... Has there been a good film version of Canterbury Tales? Uh, Pasolini. Oh, yes, of course. I haven't seen it, but yes. Yeah, I, he's... I, I, I think he his sensibility actually kind of matches Chaucer, that sort of... He's got a weird medieval sensibility, um, you know, growing up in Catholic mm-hmm. post-war Italy. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it works. It's got Tom Baker in it as well, which is always... Uh, uh, and I think he does full frontal nudity as well. So you've got Doctor Who. Oh, sorry, I'm just I'm just nipping off to watch a film. <laughs> so I've sold it to you, haven't I? Yeah. Adaptation is really interesting. If you get something like The Wife of Bath, which, well, just Canterbury Tales anyway, it doesn't lend itself to a 90-minute movie. Most films, most books and plays don't lend themselves to a 90-minute movie. So there's so many choices about what you leave in and take out. The idea of 
doing the Canterbury Tales is very perverse and well it's pure entertainment so why not yeah and um, I think he was Pasolini was on a bit of a a run of doing like literary adaptations and he did the the Cameron which of course Mm -hmm. is is influenced the Canterbury Tales basically Canterbury Tales is a riffing on on the Decameron and Mm -hmm. what else did he do he did Oedipus Rex and and then of course he did his Bible film his Gospel According Mm -hmm. to St Matthew and uh, so, yeah, I think there's a, a sense that he's sort of, Pasolini's just sort of cl- ticking off uh, a bunch of his things. But he's always choosing the things which really match his own sensibility. So he can do his own thing. There's plenty of sex in there. And there's these some of these biggest issues. I really enjoy those movies. I think they're, I think they're some of Pasolini's best work. Um, I, I can't believe I'm saying this to someone based in Italy, but I haven't seen much Pasolini. I should, I should direct him that. I watch a lot of Italian silent cinema, but like, sorry, Italian silent cinema, but I'm I'm a bit ignorant when it gets later, sort of Pascabiria. Pas, <laughs> the one I'd like recommend, I think, is a really interesting place to start, maybe, would be Theorem, the Teorema, the, uh, the one he did with Terence Stamp. You know, there was this, also mm. this craze in the early 60s, late 50s, to do always, in Italian cinema, to have one major English speaking star, even if the whole film will be dubbed into Italian anyway. So you have Richard Harris in Red Desert and you have Terence Stamp in, Stamp in this one. And Dario Argento has David Hemmings in Fondo Rosso. And so, the, yeah, there's, there's something to be said for that. And Clint Eastwood in Fistful of Dollars. When, yeah. Yeah, and, and not the star, but it's Barbara Steele, Birkenhead Hometown Hero. Yeah, she did. She did a bit of Italy. <laughs> Oh, she did a load of uh, Mario Bava films and Fellini. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Well, Anita Ekberg in La Dolce Vita as well, although she's not in that much of it. But for, you know, she burns a hole in the screen, so that, that everybody you know becomes the the thing that everybody remembers about the movie. And and this is you know not to just be that person, but this brings us back to Pandora's box. There's this whole thing about having this American starlet come in and take the lead in your art arty German literary film, you know? Why not? I mean, she wasn't even a star. She was just, she was someone who wasn't making it big in the Hollywood studio system because she didn't like doing what she was told. She she had her photograph in the magazines, but she didn't have this amazing CV of starring roles. And then you put her in an adaptation of one of the nation's favourite plays. Amazing, amazing, shock tactic casting. That is, it is so funny how casting runs along those similar lines so early on as well. You know, it's uh, that is something, yeah, I would think of more as a post-war thing, but absolutely. Well, you get it a lot in the silent era because of the obvious the no language difficulties. And then you get people like Anna Mae Wong who came to Europe because in Europe, people would cast her as the leading lady, but because of like a uh, sort of prohibition against what they call miscegenation, you couldn't do that in America. So she had the most terrible roles over there and she came over here and she made some beautiful German and British films. And it was really sad. Like, I don't want to be, you know, a cliche of myself, but it was quite sad for a lot of people when sound came in. It did make things a lot less exciting, you know, when it comes to that, because dubbing is not the same. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a notable sort of sense of loss. Uh, I mean, this brings me to because I wanted to, to talk a little bit about probably the most enduring films of the silent era, which uh, which I would argue are the comedies, are the you know the Chaplin and the Keaton and the Harold Lloyd and um, Mabel Normand. Yes, yes, Mabel Normand. Of course, we're talking. I was talking to Helen O'Hara about mm. Mabel Normand and how how she should have a film about her. You know. Uh, yeah. What a what a wonderful story! And there are, we we have how many films about Orson Welles? Uh, we have nothing about uh, you know people like Na- uh, Mabel Norman. I mean, I love the the comedies. I have to say that comedy probably isn't my favourite genre. And I'm sort of accidentally by having like a blog and being asked to talk about silent cinema a lot, I've been forced to give these slapstick comedies more of my attention than I maybe otherwise would have done. Of course they are brilliant, it's just pure cinema when you see Buster Keaton, uh, an actor stunt. Um, watching some of these films were one of the reasons why I realised that I was going to love and enjoy silent cinema, not just find it interesting. They are, they are brilliant. But one of the questions that people often ask me is, you know, because they know I write about women's film history, they say, oh, is there an equivalent to, like, is there an equivalent to Charlie Chaplin, a female equivalent? And you have to, and then you really disappoint them because you say, yeah, there was. But of course, no one gave her a studio, you know. In fact, she got yeah. treated quite abysmally and then also forgotten. And then Charlie Chaplin gets to write in his autobiography that 
he didn't think she was any good and wouldn't let her direct him and all this kind of thing. So you, you like, there isn't an equivalent because those great stories of the great slapstick comedians is the freedom they had and the sort of control they had. I mean, I'm not suggesting, you know, I'm not trying to do anyone's career down. I'm just saying, you know, when you watch a Buster Keaton film, you watch you the great ones, you watch someone who's been able to control everything and really come up with his conception of what's going to look exciting on film the whole way through. I mean, it is just a joy to watch and... Yeah, I would like to see a film about Mabel Normand, but I also just get so angry when I think about her. Yeah, no, no, I... I, I agree, and I think that there's, you know, I think there's an injustice, obviously, to the individual historically, and then there's an injustice to audiences because we've been deprived of a broader sense of comedy and who is out there doing this stuff, you know. Alice Key Blaschet made amazing comedies. She made a film which I often show to people, often show to students. See, I am masquerading as an intellectual. <laughs> um, she made a film called Madam's Cravings, which is just, it's a. It's kind of a chase film, very popular at the time. But what's chasing? <laughs> it's a pregnant woman who's got cravings and she wanders around eating and <laughs> stealing things that you shouldn't eat. And so you have interspersed people with, with this chase where people are chasing her saying, you know, why did you steal my cigar or my herring, whatever, my baby's bottle, I think, at some point. But you have interspersed these amazing, what we call facial comedy, and like the close-ups of her gurning with pleasure as she's eating. This is like the picture of a woman who is very funny, but also we're just showing like female desire on the screen in the biggest close-up that you could ever see. There, there are some great female-led, female-directed comedies there's one called Daisy Doodad's Dial, which is a British film, which is, you know, really funny, all about close-ups and funny faces. But they're just, they're just, they're not shown enough. They're not talked about enough. Also, there aren't as many, because there aren't as many people who had, as many women, as many women people who had that uh, opportunity. You know, when you see it, you sort of feel like you've stumbled across something you're not meant to see, to be honest. I'm not suggesting anything against your slapstick heroes who are obviously great filmmakers. Did you notice in the trailer, this film won't have come out yet, but the trailer for Last Night in Soho, the two actresses do the gag that's quite popular from the Marx Brothers film, the gag in the mirror. But that goes back to the silent era. People were doing that in various different comedies beforehand. And I love seeing how a gag can go from one comedian to another comedian. And then in this case, to a horror film, wonderful stuff. This sort of repertoire of physical comedy is very exciting and it also well this is me being a bit cheeky but you know it kind of betrays this idea about tourism because as soon as you've got a slapstick performer the script is going to say fall over but what's clever is how they do it really yeah you know and a lot of that is on the performer alone like not always there will be situations where the director has worked out where the director is the performer but yeah you see people taking something from the stage that maybe their grandfathers might have watched reworking it and it gets reworked every generation and now it's in a horror movie trailer Hopefully it's in the actual film, but you never know. No, well, that's, that is true. That from, from, you know, between cup and lip, there's many a slip. Same thing from trailer to, yeah, it doesn't rhyme, but you get the idea. There used to be, there were female Keystone cops as well, weren't there? Well, I mean, Mabel Normand was at the at Keystone, yeah. And there were also the, what, they were called the Bathing Beauties, who, you know, Carol Lombard, for example, learned a lot of her physical comedy while she was in that slightly less than glamorous role, really. I mean, it's not really a great idea. It's not a really great role to have, the bathing beauty, but she did get to learn to pin, punch and kick, and then you see her on a train with John Barrymore doing her Max Senate. Pin. And you get you get um, Helen Gibson in one of the, I mean, one of the longest-running movie series that happened. So, I mean, not only were there performers out there, there was obviously an audience for this, because that was hugely popular. Yeah, I mean, I... At the time we were recording this, I had an article out on a newspaper, British newspaper earlier this week about Thelma and Louise, and because it's 30 years old, love that film, who doesn't love that film? I scrapped a whole paragraph because I thought I was getting too nerdy for the newspaper. Maybe I shouldn't have done it, which was just to say, you know, and if you want to see women doing stunts and having adventures and go out in the deserts of America, yeah, you can probably go back to the silent era. But nothing that they do in that film, you know, is different from the serial queens like Helen Gibson, you know, exploits of Elaine and all this kind of thing. There's fun, there's fun to be found in the silent era. It's, it's a fun, fun time. <laughs> the more you repeat the word fun, uh, the, the, the worse it sounds though. You gotta be, you know, come have chemistry can be fun. You know, that's the, the it's like a simple. If I wasn't academic, if I wasn't academic, I'd be there at like Freshers Week saying, sign up for the fun silent cinema module. 
people have preconceptions about everything. I think people have preconceptions if you talk to them about Pasolini that it's going to be not enjoyable, that it's going to be fearsome, that you have to have understood all these old books. And you know, people have preconceptions about the silent era that it won't move them in the same way that a more recent film will. So it won't be fun, it won't be sexy, it won't be thrilling. And you know, obviously that you have to make allowances for a difference for decades and decades, but there is so much pleasure to be found in these films. And none of us would be talking about these films. Well, no, there are people I know who are interested in talking about shot length and frame rates. Great. That's not where I come in. That's why I'm more of a critic than a historian. I like some pleasure. Thank you. Or at least something to engage my brain. Talking about pleasure, I, I we do a, a, a film club at the university and it's it's essentially just an opportunity for me to try to inculcate uh, my favourite films onto people as if it, that's the new canon. And they're predominantly young women predominantly in the, from 19 to, to 24, 25. And we we did a double bill of uh, Sherlock Jr. and um, City Lights. And they all loved Buster Keaton. They loved, and they, they liked City Lights. They thought that was great. But the Sherlock Jr., they were like, it was this shock that it was like, okay, I sat down to watch it and I thought, okay, John's trying to you know drag us into something and then they just sort of loved it and they were, I've never seen them so enthusiastic one of them was saying this is one of my top three films now 19 to 20 20 odd years old they're interested in movies they want to come to the film club but you, I didn't need to persuade them I think maybe when you were talking earlier about sort of okay you, there's some resistance maybe about talking about these particular films that are a little bit outside of what you're you're interested in but also as a critic, personally, I find it difficult to write about these films just because why do you need to write about them? They're, look, just watch them. <laughs> They're just, you know what I mean? There's no sense that they need explaining or or in any way. I mean, I'm sure there's some great writing out there about oh, Ke- yeah. Keaton and Chaplin, obviously. Oh, you know, my God. And I've, I've read a lot of it. Wonderful but... writing, all by me. No, sh- <laughs> voices in my head that talking but you know i mean you know you can even talk about sherlock jr as you know meta cinema you can talk about how the surrealists really appreciated it and you can also talk about how great it is when he goes straight through the fence of the of the motorbike i think you can engage with that film on so many levels you can't maybe engage with it uh, as regards the social issues it's pushing or something like that you know but you can i think that we can describe it i think that we can talk about what what it tells you about his art and what it tells you about how cinema was seen at the time and what it tells you a bit about, I mean, you were just talking about how important it is to fall asleep and dream inside a movie. I mean, that's Sherlock Jr. You know, <laughs> it's not even the first time that idea is on screen, but I mean, it is. I mean, it's the idea we all have this sort of idea, whether we're Mia Farrow or Buster Keaton, that wall is permeable. You know, that screen is permeable. And Sherlock Jr. with a sequence of edits where he goes from location to location, brilliant. Brilliant. Just simply tells you, you know, reminds you. It's just like watching F is for fake. You know, reminds you that you're watching a film, that it's all a contrivance. And then, of course, it gives you this wonderful chase sequence, which just shows you, and by the way, I'm still the master at this. Even though I've slightly undercut and I've talked about genre and I've made you see the falsity of this, now I'm just going to show you what I can really do. Uh, Anyway, you don't want me to give you a lecture on how great Charlotte Jr. is. I do wonder sometimes with these films, one of the things you do have to say, if there's one thing to say, is like, not one day, you know, a a light bulb popped over young Buster Keaton's head and he made one film. It's like, no, he was responding to things that were happening. People were playing games with cinema in this way. This should go in context. I can see that following on from it, City Lights might seem a little bit uh, more traditional but of course I mean that's just a film that's basically just a symphony and it goes in movements of Mm. different you know ideas about what the world is and what it can be which is very similar to Sherlock Jr he just he's more engaged with the real world and his version of the real world doesn't look like the real world to us so nobody nobody engaged negatively with it nobody said oh I really love this and I hate this they were all I we love both of them probably this one just was the one that shocked me the most into thinking I didn't think silent movies were going to be you know and they'd already seen Chaplin because we did the great dictator before Christmas I think 
Everybody thinks they know Chaplin anyway. People who've never seen a Chaplin film think they know all about him. He's so famous. It's like Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley. Like, you could have not listened to anything. But you know, you know. And so, of course, actually watching the films always has that sort of extra frisson. And you think, well, no, but I, want, I, th- I knew it was meant to be funny. But it actually is funny. I think that's the... You, you, you think... It's a bit like, what did Rowan Atkinson say about a Shakespeare play? Julius Caesar isn't a comedy. If it was a comedy, Shakespeare would have put a joke in it. You know, it's <laughs> in uh, one of his not the nine o'clock news sketches it's that sort of you think because it's old it's not going to be a comedy because it's not good i'm not going to be able to relate to it but there's more laughter in in 10 minutes of uh buster keaton than than you know 90 minutes of uh, any modern comedy partly because most modern comedies are like an uh, uh like nearer two hours 20 minutes than uh Oh, and quite often you have stunts that haven't people haven't spent so long working out. You can't really sort of um, what's the word? You can't really make allowances for the fact that some people have just been trying to make people laugh with this one thing, this one movement, this one little persona, this one you know situation with a ledge like a window ledge or something like that or a roller skate that that they have put so much work into and i mean that's the key is that i mean obviously we get something like city lights that took like two and a half years to make it yeah. better be perfect yeah yeah and the fact his name is like buster is is a name after is named after how how he falls over you know just... The story is, and there's some amazing stories about Buster Keaton, you don't have to believe any or all of them, but the idea is that he fell down the stairs and Houdini said, boy, that's some Buster. And then Jack the Ripper turned up. I am um, just, maybe I'm a horrible old cynic. I don't think I feel that way. But I read a lot of film history that comes via the biographies and the press, you know, the magazines and things like that. And I sort of, I, I believe some of it, or I believe some version of some of it. Especially when you've heard a great anecdote again and again, you can, it can be quite productive work to just try and work out. Well, if this was in some way real, what really happened, which I've, I've done a bit of, you often hear people taking credit for things. And if you actually unpick it, you realise that something might have perhaps more interesting went on there, but who's to say? Because you're doing uh, your silent London blog and you're concentrating a lot on silent cinema, but you're also, as you said earlier, working as a, as a, as a critic and writing stuff on contemporary, contemporary stuff. Do you ever watch a, a movie and think, uh, like a, a recent movie, and think, this is a silent movie? I can see the line here, the, the way it's operating... You could turn the volume off this and just watch it. Yeah, yeah, I, I do see that. And you often do have films that have got very little dialogue and you think actually they didn't need it. But what's interesting is that, you know, when you start getting narrative feature films, people are thinking about what they've seen on theatre and what happens in novels. But they have to then think very creatively about ways to avoid having to have too many intertitles. Or, or dialogue into titles so they have to think very creatively about how to show what's going on and they have great directors like Ernst Lubitsch that do this but one of my least favourite things in modern cinema is a film that has dialogue and it's bad dialogue you know when you think you could have done this with a visual trick or just you know there's action films that just say look over here look over here but yeah I'm trying to think of a recent example there was a really good one recently well do you know what I, re- I recently reviewed a film that's not particularly good but the bulk of the film was basically silent it's a new Hollywood film it's the Robin Wright Robin Wright sort of knockoff of Nomadland where she goes and lives in a cabin and so much of the film that's really interesting is watching her work and watching her fail at self-sufficiency it's called Land and actually the dialogue scenes were all a little bit banal so sometimes I think you know why don't you lean into what you're really good at you get a great actress you've got a great mountain just go do it. What would yeah. Mabel Norman do? Obviously you have been, you know, for example, you have a film like The Qu- A Quiet Place, which was really fun with what it could do without exposition. And I really enjoyed that. And it, it gave me a lot to think about. I rewatched it. I have to see the new one. Although I've heard it's louder, so... Mm. They, sh- they should indicate that in the title then. It should be called A Less Quiet Place. Yeah, a slightly noisier place. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I don't know if you saw, there was a really great Robert Redford film called All Is Lost. I thought it was epic, and that thought, epic, appeared in the trailer under my name. I'm so sorry. Don't even see this film, but you might find it quite interesting. There is dialogue in that. I think he sort of swears once, but there's no need. You know, the whole film tells you its story, beautiful story, and if you've read all the old Bible stories that you're clearly aware of, it's quite a simple story, yeah. but beautiful film. Doesn't need dialogue. You've got a man on a boat. He should yeah. show it with Buster Keaton's The Boat. And it's just him doing stuff. It's just him, like, he sees a storm and he goes and shaves. And from that juxtaposition of those two things, 
you understand his whole character. Him and his sextant, it's, it's, a, it's a real journey. It's fantastic acting and it's fantastically cleverly arranged. And I don't think it was a particularly big hit. I suppose it's quite a depressing prospect for people. I remember reading Redford was really pissed off at the studio because I think he thought this was a genuine Oscar performance and they kind of undersold it. They just, just I think it was, he said something about, you used John Bleasdale's quote? <laughs> Of all the critics, and it, you only use one word. You know, and, and Pamela had written that lovely blog post yeah. all about it, and you just ignored that. With the artist, there was a big campaign saying, you know, it's silent, but you'll still love it. It's silent, but actually it's got a little bit of talking, you're fine. It's silent, but it's so glamorous. Whereas I think I saw All Is Lost at London Film Festival, and there was, at that point, though, I don't think there was much hype about it at all. No. Uh, obviously, I was dashing to the press screening. In fact, I fainted after watching that film, but it's... It, um... That's so funny, because you've got... You've watched this film about this guy who's so self-sufficient, storms can't kill him, this can't kill him, sharks can't kill him, and then you have a bit of low blood pressure and you collapse. I just sort of got a bit weedy there for a minute, had lemonade, I was tight and fit. You, you were grabbing your sextant and lemonade, <laughs> ready for the ready for the, for the next adventure, which was just sitting in a room and watching another film, let's face it. Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, yeah, so wonderful. People can still do it. I think a lot of people that I spoke to didn't didn't take what I took from All Is Lost. That's okay. We all have our different interpretations. I thought it was very sort of clear what was going on. Mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there are all these films that are really interesting and get kind of one of the reasons why I'm glad I'm a film historian as well as a critic is that I'm allowed to say this film is just as important to me. When a film comes out by a director who's made great things, people don't like it as much. I just think, oh, fascinating. Oh, he's done something weird and stupid. I want to know all about it because you. You can just enjoy it for what it is. I'm not here to tell people necessarily go and spend £10 at the Odeon on this. Although I do also do a weekly film recommendations newsletter, so I also have to do that sometimes. But, you know, who doesn't want to see the silent Robert Redford film? And, and now, you know, people are queuing up to see it. Yeah. And, you know... People's careers are more interesting. And, you know, nowadays, I think, like, the cool opinion is to say that Monsieur Verdu is your favourite Charlie Chaplin film. I think that's a very credible, hipsterish response. I mean, it's not the best but of course people didn't like it at the time because it was so dark and weird but part of you is like don't you want to see Chaplin do dark and weird of course you do and people are much more interesting than star rated suggests what, what people's work is more interesting than that but also if you're really interested in whether it's an actor or a cinematographer or a director or a screenwriter you want to know all about all the different things they did and tried and and you know just that's what i was saying about silent cinema i love to see people try to do something new it's exciting it's a shock you know the shock of sherlock jr yeah, yeah, absolutely. The shock of the new, and even if even when it's almost a hundred years old, it's still new. You know, we're finding lost films, and there are films that people just haven't been watching. I know people are confused about terminology or have strong opinions about terminology, but there are films that have been overlooked. There are films that we haven't been pushing. There are people who don't know about a lot of silent films, and there are so many great ones to watch. So they're new each time you haven't, if you haven't seen Shattered before, if you haven't seen Caligari before, if you haven't seen any number of Victor Sernstrom's silence, you're, you're just going to be blown. My mother watched The Crowd the other day because she picked up the DVD for free in her little free library on uh, the flats where she lived. And I, I didn't want to tell her anything about it except to say, it's a masterpiece, just go and enjoy. But not enough people see that film. I only saw it very recently, I, I, I have to admit. it's It's been on my watch list for like three or four years and I, I actually got the chance to see it recently. And, and yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's just, I mean, that's a film that you see so much of life. It, it is one of those movies where you're looking at the corners of the screen because you're looking everywhere to see what's happening behind the people as well as you know the main story yeah i mean it, it's just right where you hasn't been seen it recently sh showed uh Pordenone, and actually a lot of people who go to Pordenone haven't seen it you know it's just right. a crime shame because king vidar film which is about a young man trying to make his life in the city is completely deathless it has an incredible shocking moment in the middle of it which i will not spoil having spoiled pandora's box and it's in it's terribly moving and it has a wonderful wonderful ending wonderful ending it's got like zero name recognition out there i mean i can't say who but i'm working on a, a project to do with a big star at the moment one of the biggest stars in the 1910s international star and i just know that if i left my house and walked down the road no one would have 
recognize the name and I've spoken to cinephiles you know clever people like yourself and they go yeah I know the name but I haven't seen any of the films mm. so it's, it's not just about someone like me going back to the films again and again and discovering them it's the fact that you've got all this wonderful cinema that you can keep sharing with people and that is super exciting um, I'll DM you the name later as Excellent. a little test <laughs> yeah okay okay <laughs> But, I mean, it's what you said about Chaplin earlier as well. It's that, I mean, there are loads of people who, like Greta Garbo, Rudolf Valentino, who I'm almost surprised that they're actually people because I've always thought, oh, Rudolf Valentino was an actual person. He actually, I just thought Valentino, you know, it was, a, you know, a concept of fictional character. An absolute person who was from a certain place and liked spaghetti and married different people and made mistakes and yeah. and, and made wonderful films and obviously was an, an incredible dancer. Yes, I know. You sort of read a biography of someone like that and you read all the sort of mundane details of their life and also not, not so mundane in, in his case. And you just realise, yeah, absolutely. And now you're a type, you're a Valentino. People will be calling people a Valentino type without ever having seen the tango scene from the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And, um, well, you're missing out if you haven't seen that. But, uh, yeah, it's wonderful. And who doesn't want to see an early Greta Garbo or a slightly awkward Greta Garbo? The full variety of Greta Garbo. She isn't just that meme from, you know, like the sort of gif from Ninochka. Although Ninochka is perfect. Yes, yeah, yeah. Lubitsch is uh, is one of my is one of my all time favourites. I think. Well, oh, just... then you love all great silent cinema. Then, if you love Lubitsch, I mean, that's so much of it. What book would you recommend? No, it doesn't necessarily have to be about silent cinema, or you can choose one on silent cinema. You can choose, you could choose several if you prefer. But like a, a book recommendation for for something that's inspired you, or you just plain enjoy. I, I have to say, a book by a phenomenal person um, with a great title. So even if you don't know who the book's about, the book is called Without Lying Down. And it's the biography of Francis Marion written by Carrie Beecham. So it's Without Lying Down, Francis Marion and the Powerful Women of Early Hollywood. Now, if that title doesn't sell it to you, it's called Without Lying Down because Francis Marion, who was a screenwriter and executive, basically a screenwriter, a great screenwriter, she was always looking for a man that she could look up to without lying down. That line shows you what a great writer she was. And Carrie right. Beecham's a great writer too. I mean, this is a great book because it investigates a really exciting part of film history to me, all these women who are writing great films and how they sort of got a bit pushed out of the industry. And also it's written like a novel, it's written like something you would read on the beach for fun. Uh, spending time with Frances Marion in this book is fantastic and spending time with Carrie Beecham is also a really remarkable thing to do. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's a model because I'm, I mean, at my point in life, I'm not even aspiring to write anything like this, but, you know, it shows you how, what great film history can be. It's thorough and it's novelistic and it's exciting and it's full of things that other people have sort of overlooked. So, yeah, without lying down, just gaze at the front cover in which Frances Marion and Mary Pickford are, uh, are looking at you under that, under that title and you'll be quite happy. Oh, I'm going to order that today. That's all, That's gone on my list now. It just sounds like it's right in my wheelhouse. Believe me, it will remind you that Valentino was very real and human. He's in there a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. Did Frances Marion, didn't she win like a, like, wasn't she, didn't she win a couple of Oscars? Wasn't she? She did. And she won, um, she was the first woman to win uh, the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. Right. It's interesting because women are completely overrepresented in, in screenwriting and they always have been, particularly in the silent era, but there were so many of them. And still it's very rare for them to win that Oscar. And we talked about Promising Young Women and Emerald Fennel won it this year. And it's like, oh, it's still just not one that they often get. The reason there were so many screenwriters in the silent era who were women was because the audiences for the films were women and even male executives were like, well, let's hire loads of women. We want them to write stories for women. And I know now this seems like a very simplistic binary way of looking at it. But yeah, so you get great people like Frances Marion. And she went into the, the pre-code era and, and the 1930s, which is when we have Oscars, obviously, because you didn't have them until the end of the silent era. But then she sort of you got, you know, she was less welcome. And also she could write those screenplays where you don't have dialogue. She could write screenplays where you told the story without flapping your gums. People being able to write treatments for silent movies, being able to write screenplays for silent movies, and, and, you know, the amount of work that goes into that and the amount of work that goes into making those movies in terms of just also the evolution of certain business, as you were saying earlier. And then you read... J.J. Abrams talking about the, the new Star Wars trilogy and they went, you know, I think it was a mistake that we didn't write a treatment for all three films at the beginning. And you think, you think, <laughs> you know, that nobody thought, wouldn't it be a good idea that we, 
that we we have a story to tell like you, you do want to know where you're going to end up i yeah. mean it's not like the fans get angry or anything like that Oh man, that was so. Yeah. It it was such a mea culpa that was just like, um, wait, what? It's quite strange when we think we're in the era of writers' rooms and everything being overwritten and overwritten, and, and a, a national cinema very close to my heart is often attacked for having underwritten scripts. That's you know, you mm. know. Oh, um, but yeah, wow. He just he just said no. We didn't know where we were going. No. Just yeah. I mean, I'm I'm embarrassed to admit that when I do that with a feature. It, to me, it's like the an, an, the uh, antidote to like imposter syndrome. It's like Jesus Christ, if these guys aren't even trying, why should I be worried that I haven't got a formal film education or or, or what have you? You know, I mean, like with something like Star Wars, these big franchises, the idea that they're winging it is quite cute in a way because you know I'm I'm the perfect age for Star Wars, and I have seen those films again and again, and I've seen the I've seen the 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 whatever the net last six or 70 or 55 or however many there were sure. that came out recently in the cinemas as well but it doesn't really excite me like it's not something that i'm super into and neither the passion that that feeds off it and the idea that the people who are making all the money off it aren't even that invested themselves is quite funny <laughs> I, th- I always think Harrison Ford is a really funny figure because he's so obviously not interested in what he's doing. Do you mean uh, Harrison Ford from the silent era or this newfangled one they have these days? The new one. <laughs> there, there was a Harrison Ford in the silent era? There was. There was. There oh, do tell. He, no, he, was, he was just a, another actor of the same name. He wasn't, didn't have a, he wasn't as big a star, I guess. But it's interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a snarky thing silent film fans like to go, ooh, it's ah. <laughs> I, I love Harrison Ford. I mean, if I'm the right age for... Star Wars and I'm the right age for Han Solo and uh, oh, absolutely. kinds of things. Yeah, so he's, he's a great actor, but yeah, he doesn't seem that engaged. It's frustrating to me when there are films that are so popular and people talk about so much that seem to be so clearly made for the money. And that doesn't mean that there aren't great people working on them and that they can't also touch on moments of absolute brilliance and, oh, I'm going to be a tedious person who says, I really love Black Panther. But all these franchises, it's such a dispiriting way to go about making movies and it's such a dispiriting way to have to talk about them when you have to explain what happened in the previous eight or nine films. Well, it it feels to me like cinema, popular entertainment cinema has become, you know, okay, that might be a, a phrase that, that, that needs some more explanation, but anyway let's use it for the moment that it that has sort of become tv now it's an episodic thing and you need to to watch them in the order and you need to have seen them go back to the silent era and serials yeah 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 flash gordon flash i actually thought of flash gordon earlier when you referred to women as women people i thought <laughs> flash gordon and the women people <laughs> I mean, they should have made that one. I tell you what, this is one thing, you know, among her many other talents, why Helena O'Hara is so great. She writes about this stuff in a really engaging way and she does get involved in it. And I I was like, good for you. I I rarely get called upon to review a sequel. I'm quite lucky. They don't tend to be a can, do they, John? Well, weirdly, they sometimes do. I remember seeing Solo at uh, at Cannes and then going to the party and meeting up with the, the... the stars and the and the thing but the, the i was really underwhelmed by it so i was i was talking to ron howard and he was like oh how are you and i was like yeah good is it, have you seen anything good and i was like eh, yeah some stuff and you know it's it was quite funny how we were weaving around not actually talking about his film i was i'm not going to say anything nasty so i'm no. also not going to say anything nice yeah which is a problem for a critic uh, but in that situation you did the right thing john uh, look it's been brilliant talking to you pamela it's been a, it's been a treat thank you was my conversation with Pamela Hutchinson. I think you can agree uh, it was really interesting and lively and and we had a great time. I certainly learned a lot. And again, I've got a, a, a list of, of things that I need to go away and watch now. Please remember to like and spread the word as much as you can. And uh, hopefully I'll be with you with a new episode next week. I'm not sure because there's a lot of festivals on at the moment. So it's a little bit of a busy period, but hopefully I'll have something prepared and ready to drop next Friday. Okay, take care. Thank you.